Well, I just wanted to acknowledge, um, as Supervisor Gore daylighted this morning, that almost all of us here have been personally touched by fire. In my case, when the Tubbs fire came through, um, I was managing a 3,200-acre research station um, that was at ground zero for the most damaging part of the fire. And we actually had the um, distinction of being one of the only sites that burnt twice. We burnt again in 2019. Um, and so all of us felt really strongly that we wanted to just acknowledge right now that we're sort of shifting gears and we're taking a look at sort of the longer game. So not to minimize this um, the immediate emergency response and some of the things we may share may seem overwhelming when you're in the midst of your immediate cleanup, but as the Maui delegation mentioned today, um, you know, changing the likelihood of fire over the long term has to do with our landscape and our land use. And when I first came in to the fire discussion, um, I'm technically a water scientist. I like to joke that I, I chose water as my field of study, but fire kind of chose me. Um, I really feel like land use is the elephant in the room. When people want solutions, they want fast and easy solutions, and land use is sort of anything but. Um, so just acknowledging that, and I'm very excited today because we have three experts who are working at different scales on this problem of how to make our homes and our, the, the net land use of our homes combined with the natural areas around them, how can they become more resilient? So we're gonna focus on this session today. Um, well, this session includes focusing on the home and the landscape, and the next session I'll be honored to moderate will also bring in indigenous perspectives and the indigenous leadership that's making headway on that. Um, so with that, I'd like to introduce our panelists, and I think that's the, oh, I have that thingy, actually. Um, so we're really happy to welcome Elizabeth Christie, who um, is from the U.S. Green Building Council California office, and she's worked at the Skokal Center for Environmental Education, working with native plants and invasive species control. She has designed and installed educational sensory gardens for students, and she's served as the program manager for Eco Urban Gardens, where she developed farm to table and farm to school programs. And she is a graduate in environmental studies from Temple University and has a docent natural, naturalist certification. Um, she'll be our first speaker, but I'm gonna introduce everyone first. And then Caitlin Cornwall, who's been a longtime colleague of mine from the Sonoma Ecology Center. Caitlin's a biologist who leads planning and partnerships and advises on technical projects where she's worked um, since 1998 as a leader at Sonoma Ecology Center. She has a bachelor's degree in biology, a master's in botany, and lives here in Sonoma. And she is an expert really on land use ecology, watershed health indicators, and communicating with non-technical audiences, as well as building diverse partnerships. Um, she's a native of Sonoma, and she's been a lead author of the Biodiversity Action Plan, the Roadmap for Climate Resilience, and Homes for Sustainable uh, Sonoma Valley. I think that's a weird typo, but um, Sustainable Son Sonoma Valley is looking at all aspects of how to make the valley resilient. And she has a new website called Tending the Land for Fire Resilience in Sonoma County. And she's been a leader on fire recovery walks that she'll be talking about. And then next, Joe Nordlinger. He's the CEO of the Napa Communities Firewise Foundation and brings a unique blend of wildfire preparedness and business expertise to this challenge. He has over two decades of experience in professional services management and corporate leadership and chairs the Mount Veter Fire Safe Council and uh, volunteers as a firefighter in Napa. He has helped the Fire Safe Council grow and secure over $100 million in grant funding, and he merges private sector strategies with fire safety know-how in order to pioneer scalable solutions for wildfire resilience. With that, I think we're going to hand it to Liz, Elizabeth, to give the first presentation. Thank you. And feel free to stand up if you're more comfortable that way, whichever way you want to go. Okay. I think I'll prefer to sit. Thank you, though. Hi, everyone. I hope you enjoyed your lunch. That was really nice, a little windblown, but really enjoyable. Um, so thank you all for being here this week. It's been really incredible hearing all your stories and about all the technologies in this space. So if you're not familiar with the U.S. Green Building Council, uh, we are a national organization 
The California chapter is our largest branch, and um, we mostly do decarbonization in the built environment. So how can we get to net zero in all of our physical structures and urban environments? But in 2018, we developed these uh, wildfire classes, particularly for the audience of construction and landscaping professionals. And this was developed in 2018 um, after the campfire. So when, uh, when we first decided to develop this content, we pulled together a wildfire advisory group. So right now, most of uh, our classes are in Southern California. So if you're familiar, LA County and surrounding counties, there's three fires going down there right now. I was just looking at the maps this morning. So everybody in the SGV, San Gabriel Valley, is, is struggling with, with air quality right now. So it's pertinent no matter where you are throughout the state. So um, when, when we developed these classes, the idea was um, that it would be supportive for folks in California homes um, and California communities. But after listening to all of your stories uh, today and yesterday, you know, we, we really focus on the home hardening element. That is really universal. So you can take the, the ideas of how to retrofit your home or how to retrofit a building or whether it's new construction or existing construction and use that anywhere in the world. But when it comes to defensible space and talking about your landscape and your landscape ecology, that's gonna vary quite greatly depending on where you are. So if you're familiar with California ecology, particularly in these higher elevation areas like Sonoma um, and Napa, we know that you know, these areas are used to seasonal burns. Um, the history of California is that the First Nations have been managing um, land and being stewards of the land in managing wildfire for thousands of years. So none of, in California, this isn't a new technology. This is a um, ITEK or indigenous traditional ecological knowledge that we're now trying to put back into practice. So depending on where you're at, um, you, you really have to research what, what are the ecological practices in your community what are your native plants? What are, do you have fire resilient plants? And how does all of that interact? So that's something we really focus on when we're delivering our classes for landscape professionals to encourage them to learn about their local ecology. And I encourage all of you to do that as well in your own communities. So um, what slide are we on here? Okay, <laughs> you could click, you could click through. Yep, there's only a few. Um, but we are also looking right now for training delivery partners. So if you think your community could benefit from this, whether it's HOAs or construction professionals, um, please uh, connect with me after this talk and we will figure out a way to deliver courses for free in your community. That's all the funding right now comes from Cal Fire. We're funded through 2027. So if you are interested in that, we could provide training for free in your community or we'll partner with you to deliver that training. So, um, so these are the, the four areas that the training focuses on. And as I mentioned earlier, depending on where you're at, um, the content might be different. The home hardening will stay mostly the same, but um, if you want to develop with us something more localized for your community for defensible space. I'm definitely interested in that. Yes, so we're also trying to create a directory of wildfire certified professionals. This was part of the grant deliverable, is that you could go to the USGBC California website and find certified professionals both for construction and for landscape. So I encourage all of you to uh, put yourselves in the directory because um, there is many, many uh, certified professionals here who um, you know, we could help you get access to the communities that need you the most. So, and also if you know of anyone who should be in this directory, please um, spread the word. Let's try and get as many people into this as possible. Um, our goal here is to break down silos and really build community because we're gonna have to come together in order to be climate resilient. So thank you very much. And I'm gonna pass the mic to you. Thanks, Elizabeth. Hi everyone, um, I'm Caitlin and I live right here and uh, um, 
uh, have evacuated twice in the last um, five years or so, and the 2017 fires came within about a mile of my house. So um, like everyone around here, I know lots and lots of people who had their houses burned down, and then, and then just a lot more people, of course, who were um, just deeply hit emotionally and sort of mentally by um, the wildfires. Um, so uh, let's go to the next slide. One of the, just one of the first things that, that we did at the Sonoma Ecology Center, being a really local uh, kind of watershed-based organization, was to uh, first ourselves personally go out onto burn land and sort of feel what that felt like and see what there was to saw what there was to see and then uh, organized a lot of fire recovery walks um, over really the years since the fires and uh, they I just think it's a great thing to do um, people found it very healing to see how the plants and the land have responses built in to them, to fires. And, you know, granted in some places the fire severity was so high that it's really daunting, but um, largely what you see is that the, the earth knows how to respond and that really helps people. Uh, we had a lot of repeats on these fire recovery walks. They were good for us personally. Um, so I think that's a very good thing to do. Uh, Next slide. Um, so Elizabeth was just talking about kind of local, locally localized guidance and training on how people should, what people should do with their land and with their houses um, after fires. And so this website that's up on the screen, uh, Resilient Landscapes was one of our responses. This was, it's a really in-depth website. It was built over many years, really, by a wide collaboration of people. Um, particularly, we put together ecology people with fire people, with landscape design people. Um, and because we needed to satisfy all of those, uh, all of those interests. And I, I would encourage you to think about how when people take actions after a disaster, they should not just be blindly reacting to the one disaster. They're actually, you know, people are complicated, land is complicated. We have a lot of different values and goals. And so people should be given tools to know how to take actions that can satisfy a lot of their values at the same time, instead of trading off one against the other. And that's really what this, this website tried to do, um, you know, meet your defensible space codes, but also provide beauty and habitat and water conservation and reduce your maintenance requirements over time and use plants that are from here, from this special place, let's celebrate this place. Uh, so we get very detailed in this website um, and we do a bunch of trainings and workshops related to this content. And then after we did this website, um, next slide, then we, <laughs> people kept asking us, well, what about beyond the defensible space? And so we actually just, the press release has actually just went out today, finally, on this website, which is called tendingtheland.org. And it also is extremely in-depth and more than 50 people, experts, contributed content and review to this website. And I, so these disasters make people think about the land in a different way. They motivate people to interact more actively with land that they either own or that they work with in some way. And they need, it's overwhelming, you know? How do you take actions that are expensive and complicated and multi-year um, and make things better and not accidentally make things worse in some way that you didn't imagine? So we really try to get people, this sort of iterative cycle graphic that we use throughout this website is really trying to get people to understand it's a long-term relationship with your land, it's not going away, you're gonna keep learning, you're gonna keep doing, you're gonna keep learning. Um, so what we're really trying to push is take multi-benefit actions, collaborate, 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 collaborate. Um, and it goes, the work goes on for us too. So I'm gonna stop talking and hand it over to Joe. 
All right, thanks for uh, the opportunity to speak. I do want to recognize along the line of what Lisa mentioned, which is that there's folks, there are folks in the room who have, you know, maybe recently after, off of a fire or even two or three years ago. It's pretty brutal, it's a real gut punch, and it takes some time to respond to that. The organization that I'm involved with, Napa Firewise, is really a pre-fire wildfire resilience mitigation sort of arm within Napa County. And so we are not so much focused on response, we're focused on sort of thinking about preparing for wildfire. Uh, so like Caitlin, I uh, had to, well, I was a volunteer firefighter, so my property in Napa um, had to evacuate my family and then went and responded to the fire in 17. And frankly, my house was saved due to a ridgetop fire break that had been put in before I actually ever got involved with this space. I don't um, have a forestry background. I don't have an ecology background. I don't have a fire background. I'm a private sector individual who built a pretty large technology and life sciences consulting company. So I tend to sort of look at things from the standpoint of how do you build a scalable services platform? How do you think about an addressable market? How do you think about customers and what's their experience is like? And so I got involved in this fire space prior to 17 uh, because I purchased some land in, out in the Wooey and then saw a very large wildfire erupt on the other side of the, the valley in Napa. Uh, and that just sort of got me thinking about the fact that I had done a lot of due diligence on this property but had not really thought about fire. So I became a volunteer firefighter, got involved with the Mount Vita Fire Safe Council, really started to think about things to do with my property, which was totally vulnerable. If you ever come to my house, you'll realize why I'm concerned about fire at a personal level. Um, and so over the course of the next really 10 years, started to think about the fact that there's a lot of work to do. So what I thought I would just cover briefly are some kind of philosophical elements, uh, things that we think about that may be helpful. And of course, it's not a lot of time to speak. So if anybody wants to follow up, I welcome that. Um, if we can hit the next one. Yeah, so again, my private sector brain sort of thinks about, we got a big challenging problem, it's expensive, what are we gonna do here as it relates to thinking about funds because it takes a lot of money to address this and then what are we gonna do about services? So as I worked with Napa Firewise, we at the time we were a very small organization, had a budget of $100,000 a year and we really were just in charge of establishing fire safe councils. And really what I try to do with my board and, and part of why we've been successful in Napa, there's a lot of structural reasons for that. Um, but we benefit from the fact that we have a very active board, we're very connected with the county, and essentially um, we've, been, we've been successful at, at sort of scaling. Part of that is that when we think about funds, this work is incredibly expensive, and so you really have to think about, there's this window of opportunity. I'm not sure where that wind is coming from. Oh. The, there's this window of opportunity after a catastrophe, and if you're unfortunate enough to then experience a subsequent catastrophe, again, the window sort of gets extended, but um, we really try to think about the availability of funds and making sure that we were getting our fair market share, so to speak, of those funds. And that takes some investment. If you're thinking about grant work, uh, we really focus on the fact that to pursue and get your fair share of all those funds, FEMA, county, state, whatever, you really have to invest in grant writing. And I would encourage you to think about grant writing from the standpoint of, you know, I, my philosophy is that with grant writing, we're 100% successful eventually. And the reason for that is because you apply for these things and you miss out. It's a lottery. It's a little bit of a numbers game. And you kind of have to flood the zone. You have to be specific, but you have to build enough content so that you can just keep applying. And eventually you'll repackage that app, you'll find the source of funds, and you'll be successful. So you have to sort of think about it multidimensionally and just be relentless. This work is very expensive. It's, it costs a lot of money. So you have to be pretty focused on finding the money. Um, when you think about grant sources, it's grants, it's the county, it's the state, it's federal. In some cases, I, I run a 501c3, we have to think about how we take our 501c3 and really optimize the use of it for private funds. So there's sort of this multi-dimensional way about thinking about money. You, I just encourage folks to not get too hung up on just sort of one thing, and if you can, try to think about pursuing a variety of different funds. Um, recognize that funders in general, they don't like, they, they, they're wary of competition amongst ent entities. So part of what we did in Napa is we really tried to figure out ways to consolidate the various players. And there's, those are some of the structural advantages that helped in Napa. There's just fewer entities that are competing for the same amount of funds. And so we gained some efficiency around that. 
around services. Um, again, we sort of think about it from the county standpoint, community, large estates, commercial, and we try to think about things in the context of countywide community wildfire protection plans, local community wildfire protection plans, master resilience plans for large estates and commercial entities, and all of those things are sort of variations of the same sort of scale. Um, that model is pretty extensible. It allows us to do some reach. One of the things that we've tried to do in Napa is to be involved with other counties as well, and we do some cross-border work, and we try to make sure we're available to help other folks. So again, I talked a little bit about specialization. Specialization can be a little risky. Um, try to be, if you can think about services, do more services and consolidate those things. You get some efficiency around that. Is that a beep for time? Or is that just a beep? Okay, got it. So the last thing that I'll just share an image of is a, tra a strategy that we have that's around master resilience planning and enhanced resilience sites. And it really attempts to sort of solve the insurance issues in counties where you have um, large estates, commercial entities, et cetera. I'd be happy to talk about it um, for folks, but it's a design that we've come up with that thinks about sort of resilience at scale um, and, and, in, and including fire response to make sure that uh, you can start to address some of the insurance dynamics that many areas are, are suffering from. And with that, I'll turn it back to you. Great. So um, it's so hard to cover this in the time that we have. I want to uh, just say, with the couple minutes we have left, does anyone have a burning question for any of the speakers? And with that, I will just say, because um, we're on our last minute, right? Yeah. So in 30 seconds, since a lot of this is about working in the wake of the fire when there's not a disaster happening, how do you keep the momentum going in your community between the disasters? And maybe just everyone can share. Well, it's hard. I'll just say that. Um, but one thing we've done is just tie the concern about fire to all the other concerns that people also have about land, like climate issues or biodiversity loss. So other reasons that are there every day for people to pay attention to, to the, the condition of the land. I think it's that. We also just try to really make sure that we promote the work that's happening and not just our work, because to keep fire top of mind, you, you know, there's like sort of the learned helplessness of you can work on something, but if you're not making progress or you don't see progress, it's hard to keep focused on it. So there's a real focus on just getting the information out about the sex successes. As we knock down projects, we really try to communicate that broadly and tie in all of our partners as well, the county, CAL FIRE, et cetera. I think the, the theme of this whole summit is a big part of it, the, the human element, the storytelling, and because I think we get desensitized, especially if you're watching the news, especially in California, there's fires all the time. Um, you know, it, you do get desensitized. So really pulling in that human element, the storytelling, the experience of it, and the community building of it, that's really how we're gonna create climate resilient communities, not just for fires, but for all types of environmental disasters. Thank you guys very much. And we'll all be available for the rest of the session if you have more questions for Caitlin, Joe, or Elizabeth. Thank you.